Okay, well, welcome to Foraging for Wild Edibles in the Fall. Um, I'm gonna introduce our, our three speakers and I'm gonna start with um, Becky Halby. Becky is a proud member of the Extension Master Gardener Class of 2015, as I am I, go team. And she is also a master naturalist. She has been co-presenting live foraging talks with Jane and Puin for about six years now. She enjoys urban foraging and as with fellow Kansan, Dorothy Gale, she usually doesn't have to forage much farther than her backyard. And there's Becky, hello Becky. Thank you, Leslie, and welcome everybody. We're excited to see you again. We, we three did this program back in May and we're excited to do a fall foraging to complement the spring foraging because there's a lot more out there to eat than we had in the spring. A lot of different things. So first a word from our sponsors, Virginia Cooperative Extension, that's Virginia Tech and Virginia State University here in the Commonwealth. And they are the ones who make Master Gardener programs possible. They are the ones that sponsor our training. We are all, Master Gardeners are volunteers and we give a certain number of hours each year. So our other sponsor, next slide, is the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, and they help with the public education programs such as this. We are open with the help desk, nine to noon, but it's email only, Monday through Friday, nine to noon. Plant clinics, of course, are closed due to, due to the pandemic. Classes like this are online, and our demonstration gardens here in the Commonwealth are open. Our particular Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia serves Arlington and Alexandria. Okay, next slide. So today what we're gonna cover are, first of all, not mushrooms. So I know a lot of people want to learn about foraging for mushrooms. We just don't feel comfortable. We are not knowledgeable enough and that takes a lot of training and we're just not there. So no mushrooms today and no animals, plants only. So this is a vegan presentation, even though we're not all vegans. You'll see some meat dishes later in the recipes. Uh, we're going to cover definitions, why we forage, the rules of foraging, what's available right now, and some uses for the plants you might find, and recipes. Right next. So what is foraging? Well, it has many meanings, but in our case, it's hunting and gathering edible wild plants. Now, we'll make a note here that some of the plants in this talk are cultivated that you might find in your neighborhood. The best foraging may be in your own backyard. So what is wild? Again, for our purposes, we mean wild plants as in they weren't planted intentionally. Maybe a bird pooped out a seed and something grew there. Maybe a squirrel planted a nut and forgot about it. It's something that hasn't been planted by a person. And what do we mean by edible? Well, there's the joke that almost everything is edible once, but we want you to survive to eat another day. So what we mean by edible is fit to be eaten Moreover, moreover, we want it to be tasty and nutritious. And why forage? It gives us an enhanced connection to nature. Sometimes it's necessary. If you are hiking and you're, you get hungry, if you know the edible plants around you, if you recognize something, you'll get an instant trail nibble. And in some cases, hopefully it doesn't happen, but you may need it for survival. What we're gonna focus on a lot today is nutrition because wild plants, the edible wild plants, the ones that are good for us, they have a lot more phytochemicals and micronutrients that some of our cult cultivated crops have lost. I garden, Puen and Jane, I'm sure a lot of you are gardeners. Our gardened plant, our cultivated plants are really babied and they get water, they get weeds pulled from around them, they get fed, we really, coddle them. So they've lost a lot of the phytochemicals and other nutrients that these wild plants have because they have to still duke it out in, to survive. They have to push away that other weed. They have to find their way in the world. And so they have a greater number of nutrients that are good for us. And also availability. They're free. And Virginia offers superb year-round foraging. So there's some important rules of foraging. We want you to honor the law. So make sure that where you're foraging, it's legal to forage. 
we have a lot of national parks and state parks, regional parks, county parks, but you need to look up the rules. A lot of them don't want you leaving anything and they don't want you taking anything. Now, there are some sort of common sense exceptions. If you want to take garlic mustard out of a park, that's an invasive species and it's also edible and that is probably fine. So invasives would be the exception to that rule. But we also want you to honor the plant. Now if it's an invasive, just go ahead and remove it. And if you want to make a pesto with it, more the better. But honor the plant. If it's a wild plant that is a native, that is a valuable plant, don't take all of them. The rule is sort of 30%. If you see a patch of something, take no more than 30%, hopefully not even that much. And even the individual plants, a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is the leaves and the flowers of plants or the nuts and the seeds of plants, not the roots. If some, some recipes are gonna call for the roots. And then again, make sure that you don't take the whole patch. Don't be greedy. We want that to survive. And honor the land. If you are out there foraging around, maybe you go a little bit off trail to find something, don't make a mess. Don't stomp down a lot of valuable plants. Don't leave a lot of holes. Fill them up. Take your trash out. And especially honor yourself. Forage where it's safe. Don't forage where cars have been parked, where there might be a, an old building that's got lead paint. That lead paint can leach into the ground nearby and can affect the plants that you might want to eat. So know what you're getting into. Do be respectful of others' property. Some of the plants we're going to talk about today are cultivated and you might see them and go, oh, I know what that is. But if it's on someone else's property, please ask permission before you pick. Don't ever ingest anything that you're not 100% is safe to eat. There are a lot of lookalikes with the plants we're talking about today, and we'll point some of those out. Do learn to identify the edible plants and understand their part in the larger ecosystem. Those plants aren't there just for you. There are animals and insects that need them to survive. Again, don't forage where cars are parked or where herbicides or pesticides have been used, and the rule of thumb is when in doubt, leave it out. We hope you enjoy this presentation with a grain of salt. Puen, Jane, and I are not experts in this. We have been doing it for several years, I think six or seven years now, but we're not the end all experts. Please use your own common sense. This is important. Try small amounts first and know your own limits. If you tend to be sensitive to certain foods anyway, then really be careful with new foods. If you're pregnant, really be careful. A lot of these plants say, you know, be careful or eat just small amounts if you're pregnant. So consult your physician first if you have any concerns. And this is also something that people take for granted sometimes. Remember that natural doesn't always mean edible. Just because it's out there and, oh, well, it, but this is growing in a pristine environment. It must be good. No, many plants are toxic to humans. You, Y-E-W, the evergreen that a lot of us have in our landscape, that's toxic. You know, we still grow it. Rhubarb, the leaves of rhubarb are toxic. The stems are delicious, but the leaves are toxic. So you need to know what you're getting into and what part of each plant is okay to eat. Another kind of, no, I don't know. It's, it's like, oh, well, I see that squirrel eating that. It must be good. No, squirrels can eat things that we can't. Birds can eat pokeweed berries and we can't. I mean, we can, but it's not good for us. So just because you see another animal eating it doesn't mean that it's safe for us. So what's available in Virginia? Well, in the spring, we talked about shoots, plants, fruits, and flowers. Now that we're moving into fall, we're gonna be talking about fruits, plants, nuts, roots, seeds, and pods, all available in the fall here in Virginia. And this talk in particular, we're gonna talk about assorted weeds, which you know, a weed is in the eye of the beholder. A lot of what we call weeds were actually valuable plants from brought over from Europe with the settlers. We're going to talk about plants, some tree fruits, seeds, roots, and pods. So first, wonderful weeds. Those of you that were on the spring foraging talk, a lot of these slides may look familiar. 
the dandelions, I was just out walking through a nearby park and they're still, I, I saw dandelions in bloom. They're still out there and as well as the broadleaf plantain and many other weeds. So for gardeners, weeding can also be foraging. When I'm out weeding and I see a little baby purslane, I just clean off the dirt and put it in my mouth. It's delicious. My first plant we're going to talk about is chicory. Chicory is in the aster or daisy family. It's related to the dandelion. Now I took this picture at a nearby school. They mow the grass very close. So this chicory is actually very tight to the ground, but it will grow several feet tall if it's not mowed. It can take mowing as is evidenced here. So chicory, you may have heard, if you know about New Orleans or have been to New Orleans and had their chicory coffee, yes, this is where that comes from. The roots can be cleaned and cubed, roasted and ground for a coffee type drink. The leaves are also edible as a salad mixing, but as with most edible leaves, it's best when they're young and still tender. And in my research, I found out that chicory is being bred and cultivated as a, a high-end vegetable, even being made into a, uh, an endive substitute. They're growing it as a rosette to resemble endive. And so you heard it here first, you know, if you are wanting to get into some entrepreneurial enterprise, think about chicory. Next. Goldenrod. I wanted to talk about this because this is the time of year that goldenrod gets a really bad rap. A lot of us suffer with seasonal allergies and we're starting to have that little sinus flare up and sneezing, watery eyes. And we typically, a lot of people blame goldenrod because it's so showy. You see those yellow flowers and that's when you start to sneeze. But there's something else out there that's probably the culprit and that's ragweed. Ragweed has a green flower, so it doesn't show up as well as the showy goldenrod. And so that's why we blame goldenrod for it. But it's ragweed that is, has an airborne pollen, very dusty pollen that is probably what's getting into our sinuses, not the goldenrod. The goldenrod pollen is very sticky and heavy. It needs a bee or another pollinator to actually go in, go against that flower and get the pollen onto it in order to spread it. So think of ragweed and enjoy the goldenrod. The flowers are edible and it makes a beautiful bright yellow dye. You can put the flowers into a salad. You can put them into cookies. It's, it just adds a touch of color and the dry leaves uh, dry, you can dry the leaves for a tea, which is supposed to be a stress reducer, an antidepressant, a diuretic, and a respiratory aid. Native Americans made a lot of uses out of goldenrod. Okay. Now for the peas of fall foraging. The pawpaw, the persimmon, and purslane. So first the pawpaw. This is the largest edible fruit of a U.S. native plant, and we grow it right here in the Commonwealth. It's everywhere. You look for it around rivers. I've seen it along the banks of the Potomac. There, it, and it's ripening right now. The place I went to try to find one just a couple days ago, they're gone. They're already gone. So I'm gonna have to look a few other places. I have some growing in my backyard. The, the bottom photo here shows my tree and you can see it's got some little um, circles cut out of the leaves. Those are not from the zebra swallowtail butterfly, which it, this is a host plant for the zebra swallowtail, which is a beautiful black and white butterfly. No, those leaves were caused by a leaf cutter bee, which is a native bee, and it's not hurting the plant. I was really happy to see, since I don't have the zebra swallowtails, at least someone's enjoying my pawpaw, and no, they haven't fruited in about eight years. They take a long time to fruit and you really need two different strains. I thought I had two different strains, maybe I don't. So I'm gonna be adding to my pawpaw patch. The benefits of this fruit, it's high in fiber and amino acids. And like I say, it's a host for the zebra swallowtail. However, I do wanna put in a caveat. It contains anonacin, which is a chemical compound in the class of acetogenins. Some sites that I looked at said, oh, it's a cancer fighter, it's great for you. And others said, hmm, it's kind of a, maybe a neurotoxin and may cause an atypical Parkinson's. So again, just use your head. If you're not comfortable trying this, 
I eat them. I have never had any ill effects. Some people just plain don't like the taste. The, the taste when they're ripe, it's sort of a unique banana mango. It's the most tropical flavored plant in the US, I mean, other than Hawaii, in the continental US that I've ever found. I love the taste, I love the consistency, but some people, it gives them stomach upset. Uh, so again, just take that with a grain of salt and try a pawpaw, but don't overdo. I looked up and there were some area pawpaw festivals that have cropped up in the last few years, but most have been canceled due to the pandemic. So maybe by next year, we'll be able to go to a pawpaw festival safely. Okay, next. Persimmon. Around here, you'll see two types. You'll see the Asian and the native. The Asian is big. It's sort of like a squat tomato, you know, a regular tomato, whereas the native will be more like a cherry tomato. If you find the big ones, it's probably on private property. So again, please ask before you pick them. The fruits need to be very soft and very ripe. Oftentimes you'll see them falling on the ground. That's why I know I'm near a, pers a ripe persimmon is if, if I see them falling on the ground or you might smell them because they have a really nice flavor. Oh my goodness, my dog's sneezing. <laughs> Bless you, Dudley. Um, persimmons have, contain a lot of tannin and the immature fruits are very astringent. If you're not sure, it's not gonna hurt you, but it will make your mouth cottony like, like that. It'll take all the saliva out of your mouth if it's not completely ripe. So that's kind of a fun experience, especially you know for kids, you say, well, just try this. And it's like, wow, you know, all the saliva in their mouth is gone. Uh, they do contain antioxidants, carotenoids, which pretty much anything that's got that bright orange color will have carotenoids in it and flavonoids also vitamin A and C and others. These fruits are used in puddings, cakes, breads, etc. I have some friends from Indiana that, boy, persimmon pudding is their go-to. They love it. Next. And last is purslane, native to India and Iran. It's a common weed in this area. You'll see purslane that grows in the cracks of sidewalks. It grows in, it grows in gravel. I mean, it, it just grows about anywhere. It's a fleshy succulent, looks like a baby jade plant, but it tends to split, spread flat on the ground more like a carpet. The leaf stem seeds are all edible. The taste is similar to watercress or spinach. Some sense a bit of a lemony flavor to it. And the big thing about purslane, it's grown all over the world, some intentionally. I've even seen it for sale in farmer's markets because it contains a high level of omega-3 fatty acids. A researcher at the National Institutes of Health has said that it has the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids of any green plant in the world that we know about. So it's a lot cheaper than salmon and you'll get those same omega-3 fatty acid benefits. It also contains vitamin A, C, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and iron. However, there is a lookalike which is called spurge. And it also has that creeping uh, manner and it has those rounded leaves. Spurge leaves aren't as succulent, but please, if you have any doubts, break the stem before you eat it. If the sap comes out milky, that's spurge and don't eat it. And that's a good rule of thumb with most plants. If it's got a milky sap, it's probably not good for us. Next. So here's just a quick list of some of our favorite Weeds, dandelions, lamb's quarter, purslane, garlic mustard, broadleaf plantain, violets, prickly lettuce, wood sorrel. And you can use these raw or cooked. You can put them into pesto, soups, egg dishes, stir fries. I wanna just mention, you don't need to make foraging into an all day event. You can just go out and pick a few things and add a few. You don't have to like, make everything out of this one thing. You don't have to have a lot of any one thing. You can just add a few to a salad, add some to your sandwich, put some on your pizza, and you're getting the benefits right there without having to go to a lot of trouble. Next. And just quickly, you're gonna have these on the, on the presentation when it's posted, but this is just a few of our favorite foraging books. You can go on. And next. 
And the one I will point out, especially for beginners, I don't like the word idiot. I don't like calling myself or anyone else an idiot. But the one down here, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the Idiot's Guide to Foraging by Mark Merriweather Vorderbruggen, that's a good first foraging book because he shows a lot of the lookalikes that you want to avoid. So that's one that I get from the library all the time. That's it for me. Thank you. And next we will have Puen Lee to talk a couple, about. A couple questions for you. Oh, okay, sorry. That's okay. Um, any tips to identify ripe pawpaws? It seems like you usually find them when it's too early or too late. And if they fall into the ground, they are past their prime. I have found some on the ground that were okay. They can have a few, it's, they're sort of like bananas. They should, they may have some spots on them. When they're, when they're immature, they're gonna be very green, but there are some ripe ones that will be green. So they, they vary in color from green to yellow and they'll have a few spots on them. I've picked up some excellent ones from the ground, but for me, it's smell. If you have a, you know, normal, good sense of smell, you'll smell them, that you'll smell that mangoey, banana, fruity, really fruity smell. So when I went out to my spot earlier this week, I got a little whiff of something, but I couldn't see anything on the ground. People had really picked that clean. And the best way to get them is, you know, wear a hard hat or at least be prepared, but go up and shake the tree and they'll fall. And that's when they're ready. Okay, um, and on the second question we had is, can you, can you ripen pawpaws at home? So if you pick them up at the, off the ground and take them home, do they continue to ripen or is that as ripe as they're gonna get? That's a really good question. And one of the sites I saw said no, and another one said, well, maybe. That's why you don't see pawpaws available very often. So there's people that are trying to cultivate it to make it a little more hardy and, and last a little longer so that you can get them in a farmer's market or in the regular markets. They're very fragile and they, they don't have a long shelf life. I have not had, I have not seen a lot of success with trying to ripen the immature ones. They said, I did see one site, if they're just about ready, they may, you may, you know, bring them along to fully ripen. But if they're very green and hard, no, they probably won't. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, Becky. All right, um, our next speaker is Pu Win Lee, and she is a local gardener who directed the Plot Against Hunger for Fresh Produce, um, for the AFAC program, Arlington Food Assistance Center, until her retirement last fall. She's gardened almost her entire life. The current quarantine has given her more time to find new edibles to forage and lots of time to experiment with recipes. So welcome to Poo Win. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you got a kitchen. <laughs> Here I am. There you go, there she is. Welcome Poo Win. I don't see myself, but that's we fine. Hi. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out. It's very rainy and um, cold and damp outside today, so it's a good day to be inside um, on the Zoom meeting. Um, I'm going to start with two plants or weeds that um, I'd like to call invasive annuals. That means that um, they come back every year in my garden um, despite my best efforts to eradicate them. Um, and these two plants are lamb's quarters and perilla, um, also known as the beefsteak plant. Next. Um, lamb's quarters are um, also are part of the goosefoot um, amaranth family and they're related to quinoa um, and spinach and beets and Swiss chard. Um, Native Americans use these seeds, the seeds and the leaves of the um, lamb's quarters plants um, for edible crops. And in northern India and Pakistan, they're actually intentionally planted as a food crop. Um, on the left-hand side, oh, can you go back, Jane? On the left-hand side, you see um, quinoa growing with the, that seed head, um, but notice the leaves are very, very similar to the lamb's quarters uh, photo that is on the right-hand side. Okay. Um, lamb's quarters are highly nutritious. Um, about a cup of raw greens contains the recommended daily uh, allowance of of 73% of vitamin A and 96% of vitamin C. And it's also high in um, B vitamins. 
um, on the left hand uh, photo, you see a, a picture of uh, seedlings that popped up in my yard um, this last spring. And um, they were tender and I could just cook the stem and the leaf together. Um, inevitably, every year when lamb's quarters appeared in my yard, by the end of May, early June, I have leaf miner damage on the plants. And so it, my tendency has been to pull them out um, because it's so unsightly. Um, but this year, um, because of the pandemic, and I didn't want to keep on going to the grocery store for spinach, I thought, well, what the heck, I'm going to just leave them to grow in my yard. Um, and lo and behold, in two or three weeks, the plant actually outgrew the, the um, leaf miner damage. Um, had um, the, the um, insect life cycle had passed. Um, and I started reading um, that organic farmers um, make it a practice sometimes to use um, lamb's quarters as a trap crop, um, a companion plant for related uh, cash crops that are like uh, Swiss chard and beets and spinach. Next. So here it is in my yard. Um, some of the plants that I left, there's three on the left. Um, they are right up against the front of the house under an eave and receive very little uh, rain or even, uh, I never watered them all summer long. Um, this is an early August uh, photo and the plants grew to be about three feet high and just about as wide. And then at the end of August, um, the seed had started forming. And you see that on the right-hand side. And at that point, I, I pulled them all out. I figure that they are, they'll pop up anyways, um, even if I don't have these, the, uh, this, uh, the plants going to full um, maturity. Okay, next. Um, so one thing that when I was pulling the plants and I, can you see this? I actually had to dig this out. Um, this is the, the huge taproot. And um, I measured this is about, well, there's one, it's about 16 inches long. Um, when you are um, cleaning your um, lamb's quarters, you'll notice that there is a powdery um, substance on the, the leaves. And it turns out that these are actually mineral salts that have been pulled up by the taproot into the plant. And if uh, the minerals cannot be used and utilized within the plant, um, they are excreted um, by the leaves, um, released by the leaves. And that's what that, that powdery substance is. Um, on the right-hand side, I'm showing you um, just the ends of a, a lamb's quarters dish that was made um, in our household. Um, I cook and use it just like spinach. Um, it freezes really well. You just um, take the leaves off and blanch them and, um, and put them into the freezer. So next. The next plant I'm gonna talk about is perilla. Um, it's a part of the mint family. It's used as an herb, a uh, vegetable, and is, the seeds are also used as an oil uh, crop in China. There are several species um, of perilla. Um, and this one, um, they all have varying um, appearances and tastes. Some have a frilly edge, some have a more heart-shaped leaf. Uh, but in general, this is the appearance and they can be green or purple or even a red color. In Japan, the red perilla is used um, to actually dye um, their uh, pickled plums, the umeboshi. Next. Um, perilla in, prefers moist areas um, and can survive in sun to part shade. Here on the right is a photo of um, three perilla plants that uh, grew in next to my rain barrel in the back part of my garden. Um, it's very moist there and uh, they just, uh, these, these plants were about four feet tall um, before I pulled them out. Um, the seeds are high in iron, calcium, niacin, protein, and thiamine, and the leaves, which are what I'm, I use, are rich in vitamins A, C, and riboflavin. They're native to China and to the Himalayan regions um, and were brought to Europe as a landscape plant 
Um, I've read that Victorian gardeners like to use them as the border uh, for beds of coleus, which is a related plant um, to the perilla. Um, they were brought, therefore, to the United States as a landscape plant, and like many landscape plants um, uh, brought from other countries, like uh, English ivy, um, they've become naturalized through the eastern and central United States, and they can be incredibly invasive. Uh, I've seen them in River Bend Park along the um, paths along the river, um, and I've read that uh, they, the plants can invade pasture land um, and have caused uh, respiratory problems in um, grazing animals. So farmers like to uh, keep an eye out for them and, and pull them out as, as quickly as they appear. Next. Um, so I just wanted to show you a few of the dishes um, that can be made um, using perilla leaf. Uh, on the left is a Korean um, side dish. Um, usually if you go to a Korean restaurant, they'll give you five or 10 or even up to 20 um, small side dishes. They're function as uh, condiments or just little uh, snacks. Um, this is the one on the left is a is just perilla leaf that has been immersed and layered with a mixture of soy sauce, garlic, um, hot chilies, and um, honey. Um, there's one more ingredient in ran rice vinegar. Um, you just let it set for a few hours and then you have, a, you have something that you can eat with plain rice. And on the right hand side um, are perilla leaves that are used um, as a wrapper. Um, they have a very kind of anise uh, basil uh, scent and I wish this was a live um, presentation so that you could actually uh, smell the fragrance of this leaf. So it's used as a wrapper. You put a smear of the Korean bean paste, a dab of a, a, a spoonful of rice, and then um, some barbecued meat or fish on it. Next. Um, and then in Japan, if you go to a Japanese restaurant, um, sushi restaurant, you might see this as a garnish on a, um, a sushi or sashimi platter. Um, and on the left hand side, I'm showing you um, it used as a tempura in tempura. It's a very nice contrast. This, this uh, herbal leaf is a nice contrast to heavier uh, vegetables that are used in vegetable tempuras. Um, so, okay, next. So switching uh, on, in addition to foraging for last harvests of leafy greens, uh, fall is also a good time to explore the woods for edibles, as Becky said. One tree that many people may have forgotten is an ingredient um, of root beer, the all-American root beer, and also an important ingredient of the southern dish called gumbo um, is sassafras. So next. Um, hmm. So here's gumbo. Um, in February of this year, uh, we went to New Orleans to celebrate Mardi Gras. Uh, seems like a lifetime ago. Um, and we tried all sorts of Cajun and Creole cuisine. Just before we left, um, I ducked into a grocery store to pick up a bottle of filet um, so that I could make gumbo when I returned here to Arlington. Um, when I got home, I unpacked uh, my luggage and I uh, pulled out the bottle and looked for the main ingredient. And the only and main ingredient um, of filet is our ground sassafras leaves. And so being a forager, um, and being me, I said, I can do that. Um, so um, I waited until midsummer and I began a hunt for uh, sassafras trees in our area. Next. So I found a small stand of uh, sassafras saplings in uh, local uh, woods um, and on the left. And then on the right, I'm showing you um, a specimen sassafras that has brilliant uh, red leaves uh, in the fall. Next. Sassafras is um, part of the laurel family. 
it's characterized by three leaf shapes. They're either ovate, bilobe, mitten shaped. And I, I don't, can I use the cursor? Do you, you don't see this. Um, but there, you can see there's the trilobe, the bilobe, there's just one leaf in this, this photo, and then the ovate shape. Um, all parts are edible and they're incredibly, all parts are also incredibly um, fragrant. It's a very pleasant aromatic um, um, uh, plant. Um, historically, they were used by Native Americans for cooking, uh, to flavor and thicken soups and stews, and they also utilized the sassafras tree for many medicinal um, purposes. They were a, a um, then when the Creoles and the Cajuns moved to um, the south, to Louisiana and Mississippi, um, local native um, culinary traditions were adapted into their cuisines. And so that's where you get your filet um, being added to thickened gumbo. Um, the bark is used for tea and the bark of roots used for root beer. Um, a, a warning is that um, the roots contain a high level of saffron, which has been caused to, uh, to cause liver damage um, in laboratory animals. And so it's been banned by the FDA. Um, so any product that you buy commercially that says it contains sassafras has to be uh, free of that saffron. Next. The leaves, however, are safe to consume. And so I uh, didn't ran my experiment to make filet. Um, and this is what I'm just going to walk you through it. Um, I picked a few leaves and took them to my basement and dried them for um, a couple uh, weeks down in the, in the shade of the basement. Um, if you dry them in the sunshine, um, the leaves will turn brown. And then you, so you get a brown colored filet. Um, and I'm not sure whether or not that actually affects the taste of, of uh, the final product. So in any case, um, dry them in the shade. Um, and then when they're dry, um, we strip the leaves from the stems and also the veins of the leaf. And you can take them and pulverize them with a mortar and pestle, or um, if you have a coffee or spice grinder, um, grind them up to make the powder there. So next. Um, so here I'm showing you just the uh, contrast between a, a, a homemade fresh filet powder and what I bought in New Orleans in February. And um, I think some people say that uh, it's because of the stems and the veins are uh, left that it has this brown color, the commercial uh, product has this brown color, but I'm not sure. Um, what I do know is that the homemade version is much brighter and is, a much, is much more fragrant. And then Jane was so nice um, to ask one of her friends who has a, a property with a lot of um, sassafras um, if they would bring some sassafras back for this presentation. And what I found was that the leaves, these young leaves, and this is obviously dried, the young leaves are much more fragrant than the older leaves. So that is a clue. What you should do is um, pick young leaves. Um, they're actually supposed to be more mucilaginous, so it'll thicken better um, when you're making your gumbo. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing you a, just a recipe for a, um, a Native American um, gumbo um, from Louisiana. Okay, next. So in our area, there are many nuts that can be foraged um, in the fall. I like to collect walnuts and hickory nuts um, from local woods. Um, one unusual nut is this one. Um, it's about two times the size of pistachios, and I'm going to show you here. I have one right here. Um, and it comes from the ginkgo biloba tree. Next. Um, this is a, some, a photo of ginkgo biloba trees in, uh, around DuPont Circle on Riggs um, Street Northwest. Um, they have this beautiful, a beautiful fan-shaped um, 
yellow leaf in the fall and are brilliant um, in color. Um, next. Um, ginkgo is used um, often in, um, uh, in the U.S. as uh, landscape and streetscape trees because they're very hardy. They can endure um, salt and pollution and um, anything that's thrown at urban um, plantings. Um, last month I went on a ginkgo tree hunt around our area and you can see listed all the places that I spotted ginkgos. Um, on the left-hand uh, photo, that is uh, a huge ginkgo on our street in uh, Upper Georgetown. Um, the middle picture is a, a ginkgo that's planted in Penn Quarter. And again, that whole street was planted with ginkgo uh, trees. And then um, on the right is a large tree that um, is in Bonaire Park, right near the uh, tennis courts. Um, this is a tree, that, the very first tree that I, I saw in Arlington that I collected nuts from about 20 years ago when I was dropping my daughter off at um, the, her elementary school. I drove past and I noticed some Asian women um, squatting down and gathering something from the ground. And so I um, did a U-turn and I came back and, and discovered that it was ginkgo nuts. Um, you need to wait until the the, the fruit has fallen uh, from the tree before you, you can um, actually harvest them. So next. Um, I think I mentioned that ginkgo is incredibly unusual and that's because it's been called a living fossil. Um, it's a tree that has virtually been unchanged um, since it's the first uh, trees appeared in the Jurassic period, 170 to 200 million years ago. Um, the fossil history shows that there were diverse species of ginkgos found uh, throughout the world. Um, but after many uh, ice ages um, and climatic changes, um, by the Pliocene uh, era, only one species, which is ginkgo biloba, survived, and that was in China. Um, the survival of ginkgo is credited to monks who um, planted uh, trees near temples and also because of human cultivation of the trees um, as a food source. Um, in 1989, um, a native, what they believed to be a native wild stand of trees was discovered in China. Um, the male, the, it's a dioecious uh, plant um, male trees are used for landscaping, as I said, and female trees um, have been cultivated in Asia for the kernels, the nuts uh, within the fruit. Um, and you can see here the, just the similarity of, of these, uh, these fossils with the, uh, a, a leaf. Um, next. Um, in Asia, uh, the trees continue to have a, a religious significance. And as I said, they were planted near temples. Um, on the photo on the bottom, you see a, a Buddhist monk meditating in a carpet of ginkgo leaves. And he is near a tree um, that was planted on temple grounds that was, is said to have been planted by the first emperor of the Tang Dynasty 1400 years ago. Um, on the right-hand side is the largest ginkgo tree in the world. It has a circumference of 51 feet um, at breast height. And it's said that there, uh, a farmer actually parked himself there for a couple of years to live um, with a few of his animals. Um, but anyway, so that's the largest tree. Um, and as I said, the tree is very hardy. Um, there are trees in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that survived um, the atomic bombs. Um, and ginkgos are also um, now welcomed as a, a, a way for uh, tourists uh, to venture um, outside of their cities and go to Yunnan. This is a ginkgo village um, it, that has 3,000 trees. Um, every household plants a tree. This is a tradition within that village. And um, when you get married, you're, you're bequeathed the tree um, 
uh, according to village custom. Um, I looked at some Chinese websites and um, they're actually offering homestays. Um, so the Chinese go and see, uh, you know, enjoy ginkgo trees just like we would go up to the Berkshires, uh, Upper Michigan, uh, to, to enjoy fall foliage. So in China, um, ginkgos are called either uh, white nut, duck foot, or silver apricot uh, trees. They, the fruit, however, do not smell like apricots. They are stinky as anything. Um, they um, are been likened to camembert. Um, when I took a class up in uh, Jackson, Jackson School, up in, um, in Upper Georgetown, um, my instructor uh, said one day, oh, the vomit balls are out again. And sure enough, you walked out and they were just uh, littered with this very stinky fruit all over the, the, um, the cobblestones. Next. Um, so I'm gonna show you here um, how to process ginkgo and, um, and how to collect it. Um, if, you, if you go in, um, mid to late October, I think, um, to Bonaire Park, for example, um, you'll see these ginkgos all over, the ginkgo fruit all over the ground. And um, what you should do is wear some disposable gloves, washable gloves. Um, you can pick them up in a plastic bag and then bring them home and the fruit will be um, soft. Um, and what you should do is rub the flesh of the fruit away from the kernel um, and rinse and repeat. Water, um, add water, rinse and repeat until you have um, separated the kernels from the flesh. Um, then put it into a saucepan and, and boil it for 10 to 15 minutes. Let it cool, crack the nuts, and then you open it up and you will see in the right, very right photo, um, the kernels with a brown skin on it. You remove that brown skin and then what you're going to be eating are the green, sort of light jade green um, kernels on the left hand side. Next. Um, a warning um, before you eat is that uh, the ginkgos contain a chemical that act as a blood thinner. So uh, it's wise to, if you have any kind of circulatory uh, problems or you're taking uh, any blood thinner medicines, um, probably not a good idea to eat ginkgo. Um, but otherwise, um, don't eat more than five to seven nuts at a time. In China, um, ginkgos are sugared um, and dried um, and just eaten as a sweet meat or they're served in sweet soups. Uh, the way I've used it is at New Year's, um, at the at Lunar New Year, um, the first few days you're supposed to just eat vegetarian um, dishes. And there's a famous uh, Buddhist dish called Lohansai, uh, where ginkgos uh, are used along with seaweed and kelp and uh, dried mushrooms and lotus nuts and other things like that. Um, in Japan, they are skewered and grilled and used as bar food, and they're used in a, their famous uh, chawamushi uh, egg custard dish. Next. Um, but for this presentation, I decided I'd try to make a dish that um, contained a few things that I had gathered and foraged um, through the summer and actually last year. So this is a, a simmered chicken dish that has ginkgo nuts and lily buds, mushrooms, and shizo. And I had foraged, so I foraged the ginkgos last fall and froze them. Um, the lily buds is a photo that I took in June when they were out and I uh, used them fresh at that time, but I also dried some. So here are some of the dried, the dried lily buds and I reconstituted them for this dish. Um, and then um, there's shiitake mushrooms that, that I bought at the store. And then um, I just did a chiffonade of uh, shizo on the top. And it's an excellent dish. Um, the recipe is on the next page. Um, so that's it. I wish hopefully next fall we do this talk again, we can do it in person and you can have some samples of the things that, um, that we cook. Thank you, Puman. We have a couple questions for you. Um, 
Okay, so back when you were talking about lamb's quarter, um, somebody had asked, which part of the lamb's quarter do you eat? And another person had asked if the um, stem of lamb's quarter are square. The, stem, the actual stem, no, they're not square. They're angular, but they're not square. Um, so okay. you eat in the spring, you can eat the leaves and the stems. Um, but then like asparagus, you'll see, you know, if you can't snap it, it's, it's too tough. Um, so as the season progresses, it's good to um, just take the leaves off. Um, you could just eat the leaves and throw the stem away. Okay. Um, let's see. Somebody asked for um, the ginkgos. Do you need the male and female tree in order for them to produce nuts? Um, no. I, oh, that's interesting. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, some, uh, another yes, that's an interesting question. I've never thought of that, that people would raise ginkgos um, willingly. Um, <laughs> but the interesting thing that I've, and I, I'm not a botanist, so I don't really understand it fully, but um, the ginkgo trees, the pollen have a sperm in them that is actually has a tail. Um, and I've read somewhere that there are thousands of tails attached to each pollen uh, piece of the, I don't know what the, the unit measure is of pollen. So, um, but, and that swims into the female, um, the ovule. Um, so I don't know, I just have to say, I don't know. Okay. Um, but you can find these, they're used as streetscape trees. And um, I'm sure if you know of someone who has a female ginkgo tree, you would, um, they would welcome your presence um, foraging in their yard. All right. Um, so one person had a question about your use of lilies and they, they thought um, that lilies are known to be poisonous. I know lilies are poisonous to cats because I have cats at home, but I don't know about people. Um, not the day lilies. They're not poisonous. In fact, I've seen that the roots are actually okay to eat. So I'm, uh, you know, I don't want to say go, go ahead. Um, but in general, I think that they've, uh, the Chinese have eaten these for centuries. Um, you said that, <laughs> that you were using day lilies? Day lilies specifically, yes. Okay. Um, do you freeze the ginkgos before or after shelling them? I, I freeze them um, when they're raw, in the raw state with the shell on it. With the shell on it, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, are the nuts different from seed balls? They said they've seen the seeds all over, but never nuts. So okay. So the, yeah, this is just like any kind of stone fruit when you think about it. So here's the one that I picked up at, um, at the park. Um, and, it, you know, right now it's green and probably was windblown. But when you open it up, it's the outside when you pick it up from the ground will be fleshy and soft. And you remove that just like you would remove the outside of a peach. And then the inside would be the, the pit. Okay. It's called the pit, yeah. And then inside of that would be, you know, what I guess like the inside of a almond would be the the what we we eat the meat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for now. So we're going to introduce our third speaker for today. Um, Jane Longan has been an Extension Master Gardener in Arlington since 2002, and she is also a tree steward. I love that we have two Master Gardeners who have um, cross-trained with our other um, sister organizations. Um, foraging is at the nexus of many of Jane's favorite things, gardening, learning, cooking, and finding creative ways to use familiar things in new ways. So we're going to welcome um, Jane Longham. And Jane, you'll need to um, start your camera and unmute. Okay, can you see me? Yep. Okay. Uh, Ken, you can hear me and see me. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about five fall uh, foraging favorites. And bear with me for a second. There we go. Um, Okay, yeah. this isn't this and I'm doing this to myself. Okay, I'm going to start with five. It's um, sumac, nigella, 
Anis hyssop, those are rose hips, and that is nasturtium. But I'm going to start with sumac and spend a little more time on that because it's one of my favorites, and I'm hopeful that you will still be able to find that and forage for yourself this fall. The season goes usually, it can last through September, and uh, it's a very, it's kind of a nice um, gateway forage because it's easily recognizable. It's in gardens and along roadsides, and it's very distinct. You can see those leaves are, um, when they're along the roadside, they, the leaves almost look like a tropical plant. And then those berries are unmistakable. They're bright red and the staghorn sumac berries go straight up and they're sort of a um, little bit fuzzy furry and that's how they get their name. This is a, called the smooth sumac that you're seeing here. So the, um, the berries are easy to um, make into a delicious drink and the, um, you can actually grind the dried berries and add it to foods. It's used a lot in Mediterranean cooking, Middle Eastern cooking. So there's an acid coating on the berries that washes off during the rain and it, we're in Northern Virginia and it rained so much this, this last few days. So you'll have to wait a while. Sumac berries are interesting in that they, um, the coating, it's not the berry itself, it's the coating on the outside of the berry that you use. So when it rains, the coating washes off. It will regenerate in a few days. And uh, a great test you can do to see if the berries do have good flavor is to, I have one here, you can um, go up to the tree, lick your finger, and kind of just feel in the berries, give a taste, and if it's ripe and ready to go, you'll know it. There will be no doubt. So, um, oh, people always ask about poison sumac, so let's get that out of the way. It is um, generally not growing in our area. People rarely encounter it. Most importantly, it has small white berries and uh, they share the same name, poison sumac, but they don't share um, anything else. Oops, I got ahead of myself. Sorry about that. Okay, so I wanna show you how you can use the sumac. You massage the berries because it's the coating on the outside that you want to use. And then you strain, strain, strain with a strainer like this. And uh, you could use, um, you really need to filter it though with a coffee filter, a paper towel, or um, uh, it's a cloth and I've forgotten the name, cheesecloth. And cheesecloth seems so old fashioned, but they sell it at the grocery store and it's the best for catching the little hairs and twigs that, um, that you don't want to have in your, um, in your juice. And you can see here, it's very clear and clean and a deep, deep color. So I, uh, you can add sweetener and it is really good unsweetened too, especially in the summer, it's refreshing. And I made some sumac recently and I put some of my sumac aid mixed with beets, which I'll get to, and froze some, and that can be thrown into soups and stews later on in the year. So here's another look at the berries and what you can do with the sumac aid. Some people say this is uh, children's favorite. One thing I like about sumac aid is that some people can't get lemons, especially now we're in the pandemic and maybe you don't go to the store as much, but if you had those ice cubes of sumac, you could uh, toss that in. And I wanna show you some things, other things you can do with sumac. Here is, um, you can make jelly. Once you get that juice, you can make um, jelly from the sumac. You can make ice cream. I have tasted this, but not yet made it myself, and I want to sumac gelato with pomegranate and orange. It was really good, but I want to make it. 
This is what the sumac looks like from the tree. And I'm soaking it here. And you need to really break down all of the, get the berries all away from the stem and massage it just a little because you want to get all of that wonderful coating off each individual little berry because that's what it does to my hands. And all of that, you can see it, that is flavor. And here's what I made with uh, that juice. This is um, beet sumac aid, a recipe I found and I've been trying to try. I made it this week and it was delicious. So the, the beet juice gives it an earthy flavor. It, it adds a little depth and the sumac is tangy. You do add a little bit of lemon juice. It fortifies the tartness. And then as with so many of these uh, berry juice extractions, you can make a simple syrup and which is just sugar and water in generally equal amounts. You put it on the stove, stir it in, make sure that the sugar has dissolved and then that's the simple syrup you can add to sweeten your juices that you make. This one you um, pour it over uh, ice, add club soda, and it tasted like a snow cone. I, I was amazed. I hope, I hope other people get to try it. So this is really what it looks like. I took this picture last week and here is the recipe, which um, you can see it's really, it's really pretty easy. The worst part was grating the beets because that's kind of messy. The color is intensified by those beets. So if you want to look for sumac, this is a book that we've recommended before, but look at this page. It shows that's the staghorn sumac on the upper right. And it also shows the fall color and it's a great ID book. Just want to show you sumac. This is in our area, a few blocks from where I am. The Nature Conservancy headquarters are in Arlington, Virginia, and this was late October. The color is beautiful. The, the, the cones of sumac have, are gone, but the color is beautiful. And this was at, of course, Longwood Gardens. It has beautiful, beautiful uh, sumac trees with wonderful color. This, this um, Lassionata is cultivated for its beautiful leaf shape and color in the fall. And here it is again, a little farther out, Shepherdstown, West Virginia at the US Fish and Wildlife Service Training Center. This, this is a good one to show because those others were beauty shots. And this is just sumac on the side of the road. And I, I'm glad to point this out because this is not a cluster of berries that I would pick because you can see it's already turning brown and uh, it just, I think everybody has a good sense of what past its peak is. So, um, but beautiful nonetheless. And here again is sumac on the High Line in New York City. And so we're gonna move on to a, a plants that may be in your own yard. And some of you may have anise hyssop. It's, um, it's in the mint family. It has that characteristic square stem. It, the flowers are poll, uh, pollinator magnets and the flavor is wonderful. It's, um, anise hyssop is a lot like licorice taste and the, the scent of the leaves is wonderful. So, um, and it also, you can, make a, a tea with it. There's a lot you, of anise hyssop. There is so much you can do with anise hyssop. But before I show you some of that, I thought I'd share these pictures of um, what a magnet that this plant is for pollinators. This was planted in a window box outside my kitchen. And that 
little yellow sack is the pollen on a bumblebee. And that plant I had, I planted about three and they're multi-stemmed. So there were a lot of, um, in fact, this is, this is it from the kitchen window back here in the upper left. That it was covered with bees. And this was taken in another local garden, the Plant Hope Garden in Courthouse, Arlington, Virginia. And you can see this yellow swallowtail just going into each tubular flower to get the pollen. So anise hyssop can be used so many ways. You can, these were recommendations I got from various sources, but you can crush the leaves into a flute and fill with champagne. You can draw a bath and let the water flow over the leaves to sweetly scent your bath relaxation moment. They also say that you can tuck anise hyssop under your pillowcase to discourage nightmares. I haven't done that. I feel like it's, a, it's kind of an oily plant and I'm not sure I'd wanna get the oil on my pillowcase, but um, I might try it. You can put leaves in an ice cube tray. I did that and then put it in my sumac juice. It was unsweetened, but just that leaf in the, in the sumac sweetened it. It was very good. Um, some of you may remember good and plenty candy from the theater when you were young. And if you eat the leaves, it is, it's a strong licorice flavor and it is, it does remind me of good and plenty. You can also chop it up and add it to a shortbread cookie recipe. This is my introduction to anise hyssop because I got a recipe from Gourmet Magazine and it had it roasted chicken with anise hyssop, um, peaches and hazelnuts. And it called for 30 leaves of anise hyssop, which I had never seen. And I thought that's gonna be a lot of leaves, but my good friend, Claudia Gerwin, who has supplied so many of the plants and berries and roots that you're seeing in this presentation, she said, oh, go over to my house and pick some, some leaves. So I did, and anise hyssop is a sturdy plant. I did not over, over snitch. And the, so this is the recipe, you basically roast a chicken and then put cut peaches in the summer and the leaves on top of the cooked chicken so that uh, it, the, the roasted chicken still is steaming up and then the leaves on top just wilt and release all of their flavor and a beautiful scent. And so another edible berry, I think this one is so interesting, rose hips, because people think of this as an ornamental plant, and it is, it's beautiful, but you can eat the rose hips. You can make, um, again, a syrup from these, and that is what you do. So you, um, you cut them open, and I'll show you later the seeds inside that you want to get out. And Interestingly, these little rose hips are very hairy on the inside too, and you want to make sure that you get, you strain that out. So again, cheesecloth strainer, you're going to do that maybe once, maybe twice to get it um, clean. One thing that's really interesting about rose hips is that they are sweeter after the first frost. So timing is everything as it is with the sumac berries. You want to get it when they're ripe and beautiful looking and even better if you get them before the hard freeze, but after a frost. And again, Claudia Gerwin, these were supplied by Claudia so that I could make rose hip syrup. So the rose, hips or it's the the plant is in the apple family and uh, you can see that the hip is the fruit of the rose just um just below the leaves and 
I mentioned that it's important to strain the tiny hairs because they irritate some people if you don't. So what you do is put the, put the rose hips in a, a pan with a little water and cover them with water and bring it to a simmer and let it boil for maybe about five minutes and then cool and let it uh, strain. At that point, it won't be thick and syrupy, it'll just be the juice. And then you can um, combine it with the sugar to, um, to make a syrup. And the longer you cook it, the thicker it gets, and you can put it on pancakes, um, drink it, add club soda, and you can see in this picture, the cut open rose hip does have seeds and you want to uh, strain those out. You can scoop them out when you cut the rose hips or if you're, or you can strain them out. Um, Puen was talking about how um, various plants were used historically and, it, and then I came across this rose hip syrup story that in England during and after World War II when people were really hurting and didn't, uh, people were hungry and so there was a lot of uh, foraging going on at the time and they actually, this company Del Rosa paid children after the war to gather the rose hips so that they could make this, uh, their famous rose hip syrup. And I'm going to go back. The, um, so the, the, the interesting thing is rose hips are very high in vitamin C. And that is another reason that they were desirable during the hard times, because people were hungry and they were fighting infections and they thought that that would be good. But a bit about heating a lot of these uh, berries the heat diminishes the, the, the vitamin C. So I've heard that other times. And with this, with this story, someone said, well, maybe the rose hips syrup really didn't have that much vitamin C because uh, it was heated to make it. So nigella is, look at that, it's a beautiful plant. I planted it in my yard for the first time this year. Its common name is love in a mist. And you can see why it's called that, the beautiful petals above that thread-like almost spider web. It's, that flower is only about an inch and a half wide. And the, uh, Nigella is, comes from the Latin Niger, which means black and refers to the seed. And that is what we're going to um, eventually get from forging this, this flower. I learned about it. It was actually growing in my yard. And um, I learned that you can pop open the dried seed pods and it's, this is the easiest foraging if you have the plant, so you might want to buy the seeds, but all you have to do is pop it open. And there are those little seeds that look kind of like small black sesame seeds. Again, as Puen said, I wish that you all could taste this because they have, these tiny little seeds are so complex. They have a peppery, sweet, fruity grape taste. So you'll want to try that one if you can. And uh, you can see how beautiful the pods are and it's easy to um, save the pod, the, the seeds inside. And here I've thrown it on some shrimp scampi, partly because it's fun and I do think that it imparts taste. Quick thing, foragers beware. This is the picture you've seen several times, but the pods are these, the developing pods are right here, this green pods. When I first looked at my picture, I thought that this black was the pods, but no, <laughs> that's an insect right there. So 
this is a, just a general warning that when you forage, you're gonna, you're gonna have some visitors come home with you or shake them out in the yard. Okay, nasturtium buds and the flower. This is such a wonderful plant and many of you may have it but not know that you can eat it. And here you see the flowers, the seeds, and the leaves. The flowers are sweet and peppery. The leaves are more pungent and the um, the buds can be made into a, a, a caper-like treat. So it's interesting that uh, nasturtium comes from the Latin nasus tortus, which means twisted nose, because it's, it is, if you taste it, it's very peppery and pungent and that's how it got its name. It also is high in vitamin C. So you can pickle the nasturtium berries and some people call them poor man's capers. They are a little more pungent than capers. They're mustardy. And so you can soak them first in a brine and then pickle them. And again, with all of these, timing is everything. You wanna pick them while they're that beautiful light green. And if you put your fingernail into the pod and it uh, leaves a little dent, then that means it's good to go. And uh, you can add the nasturtium berries to pasta dishes or throw them on a pizza. And I do have to point out here, you might not recognize that finger, but if you could hear the voice of the person, the, I got this photograph courtesy of Ari Shapiro, who does NPR, um, uh, the afternoon show, NPR show, can't think of it, but you may know of Ari Shapiro, and so I'm just, uh, name dropping here. Here's again the leaves and the flowers. It's uh, you can you can do a lot with the entire plant. And here I'm showing um, a nasturtium flower on cooked plantain leaves. And this is not plantain like the banana. This is the plantain weed that we often bring to our talk in person. And Becky has actually baked these and brought them to the library where we do our talks and they're delicious. It's, it's, a, it's kind of like a little, um, it's like a healthy potato chip. There's the nasturtium blossom on eggs. And I made this pesto with nasturtium leaves and walnuts. So substituting basil and parsley with the nasturtium leaves. It's intense, but it was, it was great on pasta. So this is a new term I learned and I love it. I wanna share it. Um, a lot of people feel like foraging is about getting free stuff. And I really love learning about the plants and ways to use them that I didn't know, like the seeds from the nigella flower pods or sumac jelly. So um, a lot of people just like the hunt too. And I, there's a site too, two men in California who are uh, computer geeks made a site where you can find plants. It's a little bit like iNaturalist where you can get the, um, get a source for various plants, but it is from these two guys that I learned the term freegan. So I'm a proud forager and a freegan. And I hope that you'll learn some things today that you'll get to try yourself. So again, those are some books that we've recommended and I've opened the one on, put the one on top, Forged Flavor.
Tama Matsuoka Wong is, this is a great book if you can find it. It's just so easy to, um, to use. It's one of the best. So I'll show you here. I'll just open everything marked. She has great photographs. And then, well, you can't see, but wonderful recipes and she draws pictures of each of the plant. She's, she's a lot of fun. And I actually heard her talk once and after the talk, she brought paw paw ice cream. So that's another one that Becky, Becky and I are gonna have to make together. So that's it. I hope that you shop the trees this fall as well as your plants and other goodies in your yard and in the neighborhood. Um, Jane, thank you so much. We have a couple questions for you. Um, one person wanted to know, do you, do you know the site of the, the, the name of the website or the name of the two guys in California so folks can find that? I have it, but I don't have it sitting next to me right now. Okay. We and can post it when we post the video. Maybe okay. we can put a blur with that on it. Okay, thanks. And one reason I didn't is because I tried to go to the site, you had to register, and then it, it, it sounds like a good site, but I hadn't really fully explored it. So I just okay. love that the guys came up with Freegan. <laughs> okay, um, so we had some questions about going back to sumac. Um, somebody said they had bought powdered sumac and used that in place of salt sometimes. Do you know if there are any health risks associated with using sumac or too much of it? I don't know of any, but again, Be Becky did a great job of talking about um, being responsible with foraging and safe, but I think that it would be, it would be hard to overdo sumac. And whoever asked that, that's a good question because the, you, you can grind the sumac and just as Puen showed the ground filet from the sassafras leaves and then the store-bought, it's a world of difference. Okay. Um, so, and there's some questions about how to use sumac. So somebody's saying, so you don't use the berries themselves. Like you wouldn't just add that into your jelly or something. Is that correct? Well, I guess yes and no, but the, the, the coating on the berry is the flavor. And okay. so, um, See, but you have to go through that straining process because somebody else asked, could you put the seeds in a blender or a food processor and then strain it out? You could absolutely do that. And you just want to make sure you'll get a lot of little bits and parts, but you can do that. And then you have the, the spice. If you're making the spice, it's good to dry them. People recommend putting them in a high, uh, dehydrator. I don't have one and I haven't done that. So maybe you get a benefit that I haven't had, but um, can you, was there another part of that question at the beginning? Uh, well, there's, yeah. So we had the, um, the question about like which part of the sumac do you use? And you were saying it's kind of like the fleshy part around the seed, right? It's not fleshy. It's a hard little, um, beautiful bead and it is, and, and it is the coating. Okay. Um, but, it, but you can eat the whole thing and it won't hurt you. Oh, I know what I was trying to think of. Yes, because the other day, because I was doing this, I had fresh sumac and we were brining a chicken in lemon and I just threw a bunch of the sumac seeds in it. I'm not sure how much flavor it added, but it looked pretty. I bet. Um, can you use cheesecloth to, to help strain that as well? Oh, yes, absolutely. Use cheesecloth. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, one of the recipes said that you have, it said two teaspoons of sumac. And so they were ref wondering, like, what exactly did that refer to? Like prepared or how, or just the straight berries? That's a great question. I would have liked to have asked the author of that recipe that question. But when I made it, I put in the whole berries and then I, because then I strained it and I wondered if that recipe was for people who aren't foraging and or they were and they were going to go to Penzi Spices and buy a little can. Right. Um, 
I think you could try that, but I don't think the flavor would be the same. It, the, the fresh sumac is amazing. Okay. Um, so now somebody had asked a question about, um, you had the chicken recipe with the peaches. They were asking what was, what type of nuts had you used in that recipe? Hazelnuts. Okay. Um, okay. And now we have some questions about rose hips. Um, are all rose hips the same? Does it matter what variety of roses um, that they come from? And somebody was even asking about like, can, can you get them from multi-flora rose? So the one I showed is Rosa rugosa, and that is generally considered to be the best. They're big and luscious and pink. I, the multiflora rose is such a small little, it's such a small little rose, and then you, you have to cut open the seed, I mean cut open and take the seeds out. I would say no, but the advantage about trying that is that multiflora rose is a terrible invasive so if you wanted to just give it a go, you wouldn't hurt yourself and you would learn something and you would also help <laughs> getting rid of the invasive multiflora rose. And also, um, oh, the, mm, skip my mind. I love these questions. Okay, and we had, I this could, question could be for you or um, Becky or Puwin too, because somebody was asking um, if any of you guys had heard of the strawberry fruit tree, gastro obscura. So I don't know if, if you have heard of that or if um, Becky or Puwin have heard of it. I saw that question. I just looked it up and this is the benefit of using Latin names, the Gastro Obscura, I think is a website. I didn't get a, it, it's looked more like a website rather than a Latin name for the, for the actual plant. But I did find that there are some evergreens called strawberry trees. I have a native plant, it's still in a pot waiting to be put into a nice spot that is also called strawberry plant or strawberry weed and it's not edible. And yet this evergreen, which is not a native, they say the fruit can be edible, but I just don't have enough information and we don't know exactly what strawberry tree the questioner is talking about without the Latin name. So needs a little more research. <laughs> okay. And um, another question for Jane, just to clarify, do, when you're using the sumac, are you just using the berries? You're not using like the leaves, is that correct? That is correct. That is, sumac is just for those beautiful clusters of berries. And, and it, this pertains to that, and I remember with the rose question, is it dangerous? Well, the one thing that came to my mind is roses are so often sprayed because of all of the diseases that roses get, so you have to be really careful there. Yeah, that's a good point. Roses require lots of spray, so you want to know your source. All right, well, that wraps us up for our questions today. So again, I wanna thank um, Becky, Puwin, and Jane all for joining us. It was great to have the three of you. you guys each offer a different, um, a different take on foraging, so that's wonderful. And um, again, this video will be posted on mgnv.org. That stands for Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia um, in about two weeks. And so you'll be able to um, look back at the recipes and such forth. So thank you everyone for joining us and we hope you have a great weekend and you'll join us um, again on another Friday for another presentation. Take care. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you.